Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we're going to be talking about a couple of really important reports. First, Tesla's most recent impact report, which has a ton of fascinating details in it. We'll go through the highlights there. That release also coincided with a huge new report on climate change by the IPCC, so we'll spend some time on that as well. And then we've got a few other quick hits of news, which we'll run through at the beginning. Quick look at Tesla stock, another relatively low volume day to day to start the week off, just under 15 million shares traded, but Tesla was up 2.1% on the day to $713.76. That compared to the Nasdaq up about two tenths of a percent. Tesla stock did see an upgrade today from Jeffries, analyst Felipe Huchua upgrading from neutral to buy, which as we've talked about, upgrades like that where they're actually re-rating the stock, those are more significant to analysts than price target adjustments. But that being said, he did increase his price target from $700 per share up to 850. From the note, quote, valuing Tesla is as challenging as ever. We raise our discounted cash flow based price target from $700 to $850 on higher profitability and accelerated growth. While at 35% five year compound annual growth rate, we remain below Tesla guidance of 50% as trend growth. Tesla currently trades on nine times revenue and 62 times earnings before interest and tax, a level disconnected with auto multiples, but in our view, more consistent with net growth, lack of legacy issues, and wider addressable markets, including energy generation and storage." End quote. One quick little note here, just because I do see these conflated a lot, Tesla has guided for greater than 50% growth compounded annually for vehicle deliveries. That doesn't necessarily mean revenue would grow at 50% plus. Obviously, it very well could, but that's not what Tesla has specified. So to me, it's not super clear, but it does look like in this case, Jeffries is comparing their revenue forecast with Tesla's vehicle delivery guidance, and I tend to see that a lot, so just wanted to point that out. Next here, we've got an update on Giga Texas from Joe Tagmeyer. He does drone flyovers there, and remember last week we had talked about him hearing that Tesla was going to be doing a test production run for the Model Y next week, which would not be this week. Yesterday on Twitter, Joe reiterating that, so I'll have to keep a close eye out for any more information on that this week. I also mentioned last week that we should be getting China sales numbers for July early this week. Sounds like that report will be coming out tonight, US time, so we'll have that to look for for tomorrow. Last quick item here before we get into those reports, Reuters reported this morning that India is considering cutting import taxes for EVs. Currently those stand at 100%. Apparently they are looking at cutting that to somewhere between 40 and 60%. Obviously a reduction in that tax is something that Elon Musk has been pretty vocal about pushing for. Tesla just now really starting to try to set up their business in India. And obviously there's been a lot of chatter about maybe a factory there in the future. It's a growing market and could be really great for the energy products as well. But it's tough to make that kind of a commitment without some sort of established business already. And these import taxes make it extremely difficult to establish that business in the first place. So hopefully this will happen. 40 to 60% obviously still very high, but nonetheless would be a significant improvement. All right, so let's dive into these reports. We'll start with the climate change report because what better context could you ask for for Tesla's impact report than this really, really in-depth detailed report on climate change. So this report was published today by the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is a body of the United Nations with the sole purpose of providing objective scientific information around the human influence on climate change. So the report we're talking about today is the organization's sixth assessment report since 1990. And that sixth assessment report, labeled AR6, is divided into three groups, so working group one, two, and three. And the portion of the report that was published today was working group one, which is the physical science basis of climate change. The report has 234 authors, it's built on more than 14,000 scientific papers, and it's approved by 195 governments. So this isn't just one paper by one person, this is a serious, serious collective effort. So here's kind of the starting point statement, the report reads, quote, it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, and biosphere have occurred." End quote. The report is dense with charts and information supporting those claims as well as levels of confidence throughout. It's pretty well put together and not overly technical, so if you want to read through it, I will put the link to the actual report in the description today. Sometimes those things can be kind of hard to track down. Anyway, one of the key areas of this report is essentially, you know, how are we doing? What is the current situation? What do we need to do? How much time do we have here? And what sort of changes could be expected under different emissions scenarios? The report states that, quote, global surface temperature will continue to increase until at least the mid-century under all emission scenarios considered. Global warming of one and a half degrees Celsius and two degrees Celsius will be exceeded during the 21st century unless deep reductions in CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions occur in the coming decades, end quote. 
So the report looks at a number of different scenarios from low emissions to high emissions from this point in time. They've put those scenarios into a table and you can see near-term, mid-term, and long-term best estimates for how much temperature would be increasing by. In their very low emissions scenario, which you could read more about the assumptions in the report, they do expect that in the midterm, so 2041 to 2060, their best estimate for the average temperature increase would be 1.6 degrees Celsius. You may remember back to the target set at the Paris Climate Agreement, that was to keep temperatures below a 2 degree Celsius increase, preferably just 1.5 degrees Celsius. So even in a very low emission scenario, this report expects that temperatures would still be increasing by that amount in the 2040s and 50s. Their best estimate for an intermediate emissions scenario would be a 2.0 degree Celsius increase in the midterm, and a high emission scenario is 2.4 degrees. And again, that's midterm, so longer term, a high emission scenario, they would expect somewhere like a 4.4 degree increase towards the end of the century. So not to mince words here, but essentially what they're saying is that no matter what we do, that 1.5 degree Celsius increase is likely going to happen. So, yes, that is depressing, but they do also believe that, quote, if we reduce emissions to net zero by 2050, we can keep temperatures close to 1.5 degrees Celsius, end quote. So what do we have to do? Well, they've put together this little table of our remaining carbon budget, showing a range of CO2 emissions in gigatons and how those might correspond to a 1.5 to 2.0 degree increase in temperatures, and then the confidence intervals showing the likelihood of that limit being achieved under those levels of emissions. So basically, to have 83% confidence of staying below a 1.5 degree increase, we would have 300 remaining gigatons of CO2 emissions. To stay under 2.0, we'd have 900 remaining gigatons. Gigaton, by the way, is a billion metric tons, or a thousand million metric tons. So separately from our world and data, it looks like the annual emissions, total CO2 emissions, are somewhere around 36 billion tons, 36 gigatons. So you do the math on that, and to stay below 900 gigatons remaining, we would have, you know, about 25 years left at this level of emissions. But of course, emissions have risen over time. That's why many people believe this is such an urgent problem, because even just leveling off emissions is a task in and of itself, let alone reducing emissions, which would potentially at least help buy a little bit more time. The faster that emissions come down, the more time that we buy. That's why Tesla's mission statement is so apropos, accelerate the advent of sustainable energy because even just a little bit of acceleration in reductions in emissions can make a pretty big difference. To put a point on it, and then we'll move on to Tesla's impact report, the report here states that every ton of CO2 emissions adds to global warming. So that sets the context for Tesla's impact report, and right away on one of the opening slides of the impact report, we see here that in 2020, Tesla's fleet of vehicles and solar panels enabled Tesla customers to avoid emitting 5 million metric tons of CO2. I don't think I need to tell anybody listening to this how incredible that accomplishment is, but at the same time it does highlight just how much progress still needs to be made. 5 million metric tons saved by Tesla. Remember, global emissions, 36 gigatons, so 36,000 million tons. That should make it clear why it's so important for battery production to ramp up quickly, for Tesla to get to 20 million vehicles, for them to get to 1500 gigawatt hours of energy storage delivered as fast as they can, which by the way, they reiterate in the impact report that those are their targets still for 2030. If Tesla can get somewhere around that, that moves the fleet size from around 2 million vehicles today to north of 60 million vehicles by 2030, and importantly, growing rapidly above that each year past 2030. Okay, so then in 2030, your fleet size is, you know, 30, 35 times the size it is today. You might do the math and say, okay, well, 5 million tons of CO2 saved today. Let's times that by 30. You get 150 million tons. And still, compared to 36,000 million tons of emissions today, it seems like a small number. That analysis, though, would miss an incredibly important point, and one that I think is made consistently throughout Tesla's impact report, but is still probably not well understood and underappreciated and that is utilization. So Tesla here outlines their business. Everything starts with Tesla solar and Tesla cells. Those enable energy storage and Tesla vehicles, but then down below, Tesla talks about maximizing utilization through software. So on the energy side of the business, that's through Autobidder, and on the vehicle side, that's through autonomy. So in one of the slides in the impact report, Tesla breaks down the emissions for a Model 3 compared to a premium internal combustion sedan. And basically where Tesla's at today is a low utilization period of time. So if we see on this chart, the Model 3 for personal use charged on the grid is going to emit about 177 grams of CO2 per mile 
when accounting for both manufacturing amortized across the lifespan of the vehicle that's the manufacturing phase and then the energy used to actually drive it that's the use phase that tesla shows here now if you can increase the utilization and you can get more miles on that vehicle each year that manufacturing phase that's going to be amortized over more miles so your emissions per mile from that manufacturing phase goes down pretty significantly and because evs are more efficient the more miles you're shifting from internal combustion engine to ev obviously the better the holy grail of this then is a model 3 being used for ride sharing being charged on solar under that type of a scenario and a million mile lifespan for the vehicle which tesla talked about in last year's impact report talked about again in this year's impact report under that type of a scenario the emissions drop down to 29 grams of co2 per mile again versus our starting point basically where tesla's at today of 177 grams per mile and that 29 grams per mile that accounts for the manufacturing of the vehicle and solar and a power wall so under that scenario not only are you displacing about five times as many less clean miles by pushing the utilization from about 200,000 up to a million that also reduces the emissions per mile by about six times what tesla vehicles are today to put it another way right now a model 3 is about two and a half times less emitting than a comparable internal combustion engine vehicle under that future scenario it would be about 15 times less emitting so while tesla may have saved 5 million metric tons of emissions this year the actual true potential for the products that did that saving is actually probably somewhere in the ballpark of 20 to 30 million metric tons per year and that can be unlocked through solar and software as time goes by as 2030 approaches the likelihood of that unlock happening rises so then instead of saying okay they're at 5 million metric tons today fleet size grows by 30 times they're at 150 in 2030 if you factor in that increased utilization you can easily conservatively bump that up by a factor of two probably more realistically at least a factor of three maybe as high as five or six driving that utilization up has an outsized impact compared to producing another vehicle because of the emissions saved then in the manufacturing phase which by the way tesla spends a good chunk of the impact report talking about how they're going to make the manufacturing phase cleaner and better as well You've got localization, which we've spent a lot of time talking about. So Tesla, instead of trying to supply the whole world with one factory in California, obviously diversifying that Shanghai, Berlin, Austin, Tesla showing a nice visual of that impact here. And then even in the supply chain, that helps localize the supply chain. So in California, 73% of their parts sourced from North America. In Shanghai, 86% of their parts sourced from China. That's saving a ton of emissions in the supply chain on the manufacturing phase. Then you've got consumption. So on the energy side, Tesla working to make that as efficient as possible, committing here to cover the full roof of Gigafactory Nevada by the end of next year with solar, 24 megawatt system, which when complete will be the largest rooftop solar installation in the US. Tesla here shows a graph of the total amount of energy produced by Tesla solar panels. So not just Tesla owned, but Tesla delivered solar panels versus the entire energy consumed by Tesla factories and Tesla solar panels way out producing what Tesla has consumed. Then in consumption, you've also got water use. It's talked about a lot with manufacturing, especially with Giga Berlin. Tesla here showing the improvements they expect from Gigafactory Texas and Giga Berlin when operational. So we talk all the time about leverage created in the financials as Tesla scales up, but this impact report shows us the leverage that's being created in regards to reducing emissions too. And that is something that is sorely needed. The final point that I wanna make then, again, going back to utilization, is related to the Tesla Semi. So we've talked about how a robo-taxi can increase utilization for a Model 3 type of vehicle. The Tesla Semi, that already starts with high utilization even before factoring in autonomy. From what I've read, it looks like semis do about 45,000 miles per year, and in some cases can even do 100,000 miles plus. So these are vehicles that are already getting robo-taxi-like utilization before autonomy, and these are extremely inefficient vehicles. They account for just 1% of the total fleet, but 17% of transportation emissions. So any battery production that Tesla allocates towards the semi should have a relatively outsized impact on reducing total emissions. When you start to stack all these things up over time, suddenly Tesla's impact on global emissions actually becomes pretty significant. Instead of talking reductions of 150 million metric tons per year in 2030, you're really approaching more of that gigaton level of savings, depending on solar and depending on autonomy. Then as Tesla approaches full scale, hopefully they're adding tens of millions of vehicles per year. Then all of a sudden a 50 million vehicle fleet that took 20 years to build is doubling in two and a half, three years. Still, even with all those things stacking up, Tesla's solving a portion, a fraction of what we need to solve. 
which is in no way a slight against Tesla, but is representative of how large of a challenge this truly is. That's why I was so frustrated last week with what I feel are relatively lackadaisical targets here for the US in terms of electric vehicle adoption. That's why you see Tesla always pushing for other automakers to go electric, even here in the impact report acknowledging that, saying, quote, significant reduction of emissions will only be achieved if all car makers push for an industry-wide shift to EVs, end quote. So I hope this report by the IPCC, this report by Tesla can help wake people up, push things in the right direction. We've seen the kind of impact that, that can have, not just on climate change, but on air quality, just through behavioral changes during lockdowns. So I hope we can get there. To wrap up here, just because it's getting late, I want to get this episode out to you guys. Tons of other things that we could be talking about here with the impact report. I'll just run through a couple of quick highlights. Tesla mentioned battery retention. So they show a graph here showing probably about 85% retention after 200,000 miles. That's always a question people have, so it's a good one to keep in the back pocket. Tesla here also shared a lot of information about battery recycling. They've talked about this in the past, but they did say that they have successfully installed the first phase of their cell recycling facility at Giga Nevada. They said that every battery factory will recycle batteries on site and that they can get about 92% of end of life battery capacity back into raw materials for battery production. Tesla believes that recycling will be very economically viable, resulting in cost savings versus just raw material sourcing. Other interesting things in here, Tesla breaks down cost of ownership. We've of course talked a lot about that. They run through their workforce, the demographics there. We've talked about that in the previous episode as well. Some interesting stuff on wages and benefits, probably relevant to the union conversation, but that is all we have time for today. So we're gonna leave it there. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and I'll see you tomorrow for the Tuesday, August 10th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.